We're starting a, a series of messages called Stolen, okay? And, and so, uh, so let me say this to y'all. There are many things that we do in life. For instance, in our homes. We lock our doors now. Used to, there was a time when you just left your doors open. You didn't have to worry about it. You really didn't, even though there was some theft and everything else, you, you really felt safe. You felt okay. Now, you drive in some neighborhoods, on the first floor of all of the houses, you'll find bars. Because they don't want people breaking into their houses and stealing their stuff. You have alarm systems. You have security cameras. You have so many things to try to protect everything that you've got inside of your home. Because you think, you know what, if I have to go out and purchase this again, I, I, I can't do it, I can't replace it. My insurance doesn't cover everything that's there. And when you come home, and you walk in and your house has been broken into, if you talk to someone that this has happened to, it, they'll talk to you and they, they say they kind of feel like violated. That someone has broken into my private spot. And they don't feel safe there anymore. When our lives, we've allowed someone to break in and steal stuff from us. And sometimes we don't even realize it. There are some of you here that maybe you had a mom, dad, or someone that has died. And when they died, maybe they had a house or um, a home that was separate from yours. Maybe they had some money. And, and so all of a sudden, somebody becomes the executor of the will. And you're sitting there and you're thinking, okay, I know that mom and dad had this, 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 and this. And then all of a sudden, you come down to that point in time. And you go looking for that one thing that you remember from your childhood. Maybe a toy or a blanket or a quilt that your mom had made or something and you go looking for that and all of a sudden it's not there and you feel somebody has stolen your inheritance the only thing that I ever wanted I didn't want the money I didn't want the house it was just that one thing and it's been gone and you get really upset because someone stole what belonged to you if you remember there was a story in the Bible there's a guy by the name of Isaac who had two sons, Jacob and Esau. The Bible says that they were twins. Esau was delivered first, so he was the firstborn. Jacob, and you gotta think of something for a minute because uh, Jacob means conniver. Hold on to her or he'll grab her. And you think, where'd he get that? Because the Bible says that even when they were coming out of the womb, that Esau was born first and Jacob was holding on to his heel as they were being delivered. And he ended up getting the name Conniver. 
And think about this for a minute. What did he do later on in life? Him and his mother connived a way to get the inheritance from Isaac that actually belonged to Esau. And stole the inheritance that belonged to Esau. You'll find later on that Jacob started running because he was afraid for his life because Esau was going to kill him for stealing his inheritance. And God said, Jacob, no longer will your name be called Jacob, but from this day forward your name will be called Israel. Because you are no longer a conniver. But he had stolen the inheritance. Well, this morning, we're going to talk about someone that is maybe, just maybe, you've allowed this person to steal your inheritance. You see, because when God created each and every one of us, his intention was that each and every one of us would get an inheritance from him. But some have not and will not get that inheritance because they're letting someone steal it from them. I talk to people all the time and I hear people say, well, you don't understand. There is no way that God can love anyone like me. You don't understand all of the bad things that I've done. I know you tell me that God is a loving God, but how can God forget the things that I've done? How can I forget the things that I can do? I got a three minute video taken from a story of a gentleman in 2011 who told his story in his testimony of how God changed him. And then we'll get on with the message. So let's watch this together. It won't work, it's broken. Okay, then we won't watch it. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'll just tell you the story. The guy was a skinhead, one of the worst. He got into it when he was 13, 14 years of age. At the age of 16, he started a group of skinheads. They were the most notorious group of skinheads that you could ever meet. This guy was tattooed from the top of his head all over his body. And they were not good tattoos. And he came to know the Lord. And he said, but God, what do I do? I've got all of these derogatory remarks and things all over. I am absolutely deplorable. How can I ever tell anybody about you when all they see is this? He went through months and months of having those tattoos removed from his face, his scalp, his neck. And every part of his body that was exposed. And today when you see him, he has a three, at, at that time he had a three-year-old little boy in 2011, now it's nine. He's out there working for the Lord and telling people about Jesus. And when you meet him, you will never know his past unless he tells you. Totally changed. Because that's what God can do if you let him. But what we need to understand is this. There are times, ladies and gentlemen, that in your life, you're going to experience points of brokenness. And realizing that things just aren't right. 
coming to the point where everything just seems to be gone. But what we need to also understand that sometimes in that state of brokenness, what you need to understand is this. I hear people all the time say, I'm searching for God, I'm searching for God, I'm searching for the answers, I'm searching for the answers. The problem is quit searching. Do you understand that God is pursuing you? You don't have to pursue Him. He's pursuing you. He loves you. He's chasing you. And He wants you to stop running. So that He can start a relationship with you. And restore that inheritance that He wanted to give you. That someone is stealing from you. That He can lock it up. And give it to you later when we go home in front of him. But number one, you've got to understand something, ladies and gentlemen. God cannot, cannot, do you understand what I'm saying? God cannot but help love you. We talk about God is a God of love, and yes, He is, because He does love us. We've got some scriptures, starting in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. I've got them here, and I'll read them. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of His great love that He made for us, made us alive with Christ even though what? We were dead. Dead in trespasses. He says what? You are saved by grace. Do you know? Think about this for a minute. How many of you have ever had someone you know die? How many of you have stood by that casket wishing for just a moment you could bring that person back to life? Because there was something you wanted to say to them. There was, there was something, something you wanted, wanted to tell them. them. There, there was, was something, something you wanted, wanted to apologize to them, to them that, that they, they, you think they're, they're never ever going to hear. And no matter, no matter how long you stand there, there no, matter no matter how much you wish, you can't, can't ever bring them back to life. But can, can I, I tell you something? something? We, we serve a God, God that stands by the lines of each and every one of us who were dead. The Bible says we were dead in our trespasses. And guess what he did? He stood right in front of our dead bodies that were dead in sin. And he says, I have made you alive in Jesus Christ. He can't help but love us. He is the only one that I know that can ever take a dead body and raise it from the dead and make it alive. Ladies and gentlemen, we are not a bunch of the walking, the living, walking of the living dead or whatever that is. The walking dead. We're not that. We're not the night of the zombies. Even though a lot of Christians walk around like they're dead. And even though a lot of Christians walk around like they're zombies. Ladies and gentlemen, you need to understand something. God loves you to bring you from death to life. And He wants you to walk that way. We are letting... The enemy steal our inheritance. And part of our inheritance is to understand that we ain't dead no more. We're alive. Every once in a while, you need to notify yourself. I'm here. <laughs> oh, I'm not home yet. Why? Because God can't help but love us. He loves us so much. 
that he will not let us stay in a dead state. That he wants to bring us alive. And the enemy, ladies and gentlemen, wants to steal that from you. He doesn't want you telling anybody about him, about Jesus. If you got Jesus, keep it to yourself. Don't let anybody else know it. We're going to talk later on about him next week or the week after. We're going to talk about stealing our joy. But first of all, we're letting him steal our inheritance that belongs to us. I hear people say, I don't have a selfish bone in me. I'll tell y'all something. I do. Down here, y'all can have anything you want I got. Because when I die, I ain't taking it with me anyway. I told my kids they better get all my money before I die because when I spent my last penny, God's called me home. If I knew when I was going to die and we used to have those uh, uh, pay phones, I would have just kept a quarter in my pocket just for that last phone call and spent it. I'm going home. See y'all later. I'm out of here. But let me say this to y'all. I'm not really selfish, and you can't define it as selfish, but I want everything that God's got planned for me. Because I want to make him happy. I want to hear him say, well done. I keep telling everybody, everybody says, what is your purpose here on life? My purpose here in life is to give you a hard time. I know, and when, when I get, I get and, and when, when I, I get, get to heaven, heaven, you all are going to stand around and saying, and, and, and God's going to say, "Have you got a witness?" I'm going to turn around and say, "A whole bunch of them." <laughs> Will y'all testify? <laughs> yes, He did. He gave us a hard time every Sunday, man. Just poured it on. Good. <laughs> I'm doing my job. But God can't help but love us. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 7. He says, So that in the coming ages he might deliver the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness in Christ Jesus. You know why? Even though I don't have anything to offer to God. Man, he's a king. He's the creator. What do I have to offer to God? Even though I have absolutely nothing to offer to him, he still shows his kindness to me. God doesn't say, hey, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. What am I going to give him? My good looks? He already took them. All my money? Uncle Sam got that. My car? That sucker's 13 years old. Almost 300,000 miles. Awesome. I'm going to see if I can't get another 300,000 out of it. I know. It doesn't look good, but it runs fine. I still get 30 some miles to the gallon. Fill it up once a week. Everybody says, how do you do that? I don't drive it much. But we need to understand that God can't help but love us. Even though we don't have anything to offer to him, he still... He still loves us. And he still extends his kindness to us. Because that's who he is. The second point is this. God can't help but pursue us. Gentlemen, let's go back a few years if you would. 
Remember when that cute little girl came into your life? And oh boy, the eyes began to twinkle. The smile showed up. It was like, how am I going to get her to like me? And you started pursuing her. And then when you caught her, the pursuit stopped. Remember when you used to open the door for her? Now the only time you want to open the door is when you want to kick her out. <laughs> and the car hasn't come to a complete stop either. <laughs> Remember when you used to, oh honey, you stay in bed and I'll, 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 I'll bring breakfast to you. Right? Now it's, when you gonna get up and fix me some meat, woman? <laughs> I'm hungry. Once, Once the, the pursuit's, pursuit's over, over, it's like, like honey, I love you. But uh, when, when you, you when we going out on a date? A what? A date? You know, like when you and I go out and and, and we're away from everybody else. I don't know, honey. When you want to go? Oh, let's go out this Friday. Okay, let's go out this Friday. And here's what you do. You sit there. I want chicken and dumplings. Okay. Did you just see this, man? This is the conversations. Without even looking up, there is no eye-to-eye -eye contact. And then it's like, let's pay the check and let's go. And you get out in the car and you look around and you, where's she at? Don't even realize that she was with you. May I say something to you? That's not the way God is. Thank God. When God pursues us and he catches us, he still loves us. Look at what he says. In the book of Romans, chapter 5, verses 6 to 8, he says, For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For rarely, rarely will anyone die for a just person. A good person? Maybe. A just person? Ain't nobody needs anybody to die for them, man. But a good person, somebody might perhaps do that. But look at what he says. But God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, Christ died before you and I were even born. And you know who he died for? Me and you. Did he know us? Oh, yeah. Did he know what I was going to do? Oh, yeah. And he still loves me? Oh, yeah. He does. Even though you could have played a role in Despicable Me, number three. You could have had the main character. You could have been Darth Vader in Star Wars. You could have been the Joker, the Penguin, or whoever else is the bad guys in Batman. Some of y'all could have been Catwoman. That's cool. You could have been Mr. Freeze and Superman. You're the bad person. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And can I tell you something? God spends time pursuing you and I. 
because he loves us and he cares. God can't help but pursue us. Why? He has an obligation and responsibility to love us because he wants to restore the relationship that was broken and he wants to have it back. Romans chapter 5, verse number 10, a couple of verses down, he says this, For if, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, then how much more, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life? If, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, then how much more, how much more will we be saved by His life? Jesus died so we could come to God. And because He lives, we live. We no longer will have to pay the penalty for sin and death. Jesus paid it. And guess what he gave us, ladies and gentlemen? He gave us life. Not only life, ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says that God has adopted us as his sons and daughters. Which means, which means, we don't have to wait until God dies to get his inheritance. Because God never dies. So guess what? When I get to heaven, I get my inheritance. When you get to heaven, you get your inheritance. And ladies and gentlemen, we're going to give it all back to him. A part of it. And he's going to say, I don't need this. It's yours. You earned it. Enjoy it. And guess how long I get to enjoy it for? Forever. And I don't have to give it back. He's pursuing. Jesus Christ, God was pursuing me for years before I surrendered to him. And maybe he's been pursuing you for years. And maybe it's time for you to stop and let him have you. Maybe it's time to stop and let him show how much he loves you. Don't believe the rest that God doesn't love you because this and that and others. It will happen. Number three, and we ain't finished yet. God cannot help but be our God. Colossians. Chapter 1, verse number 20. And through him, through him, to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. May I say this to you all, ladies and gentlemen? God is God. I heard an absolutely, absolutely deep, intelligent statement this week made by someone that was elected to office. And it's, the statement went like this. The government cannot correct anything. The only thing that can help us is family. Our family naturally and our families of faith. National stage for the whole world to hear that the only thing that can save this country is family in God. And I thought, salute, yes, finally somebody's getting it. 
Through him, he reconciled everything to himself. They're telling you about global warming. Can I share with you a little story about global warming? Remember they tell you that the ice caps are all melting? Guess what they just found out? Down in Antarctica, there's these penguins, okay? And there's some, these people, and they've been there, and they're from, they're Finnish, they're from Finland. And they've been watching and monitoring this, this, these penguins. Penguins, what they do is they lay their eggs and then the whole herd of penguins, I think it's a herd, I don't know what it's called. In, in my term, it's herd, because it's all of them. All of them will gather around those eggs, okay? Now, they all look the same, so they can't tell each other apart, except by their, their voice. Somehow, they can do this, okay? So, because, have you ever seen a penguin? They're all black and white, okay? Duh, they ain't no purple ones, pink ones, or whatever. Okay, they're all black and white. They all look the same. So what they do is, they do this. If this is the eggs, you have a whole bunch of them that they just gather around as far as close as they all can, get together around these eggs to keep it warm. And then everybody else forms a circle around them, okay? And the ones on the outer edges are the ones that are getting all, all of the, the air in the cold temperatures and everything else. And then what happens is, I don't know how they do this. I don't know if they do this command that says, look, okay, everybody shift. But all of a sudden, the ones in the center that, that are the closest, they go to the outer, and then everybody else moves in. Okay? So they're all keeping them warm. And they're saying that the, that the, that, that the uh, ice caps are melting. Well, all of a sudden, they found out these herds of penguins were dying. They all keep going around and around and around the eggs, and they can't figure out why are they dying. You want to know why they're dying? The ice cap is getting too thick, and they can't get in there to get food. And they're dying because they can't get to their food supply because the ice caps are freezing. Remember how they said that, that the ocean waves and everything were going to start getting larger and larger and all this stuff, you know, or, or, or going away or something. Boy, have they proven that wrong. Anyway, so it isn't just that God is reconciling us to him. He's also going to re recreate his creation, which was meant to be perfect, will now be perfect just like we will be perfect. So all the trees, can I, I, I don't want to like bust your bubbles. They ain't going to turn orange because they ain't going to die. They're going to stay green with life forever, never dying, okay? But anyway, we can't, he can't help but be our God because why? When we were alienated from God, he still makes peace with us. Number two out of here is found in the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verse 21 and 22. Once you were alienated and hostile in your minds, expressed in your own evil actions, but now he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death to present you holy, faultless, and blameless before him. So what is he saying? When you and I were bound by our evil thoughts and our evil deeds, God can still set us free. And that's what he wants to do. He wants to do that. So today, I want to take just a little bit of time to share with you how this comes apart, comes by. So roll the next one, Mark, if you would, please. You see, a long time ago, God had this design. When God created the world, he created this world absolutely perfect. And what he did was he wanted you and I to be perfect. That was his plan. His plan was for us to live for all eternity with him, enjoying a relationship with him. But something happened. That something that happened, next slide, Mark, is sin. This sin has broken God's design. 
And what's happened is this. It has brought, next slide, Mark. It has brought brokenness into our lives. And here's what happens. That relationship with God is broken and we try to fix it. We try to find maybe a job. And we try to find happiness in the job and guess what happens? We lose the job. We try to find happiness to fill that brokenness that God wanted to have with us and that happiness that he wanted to be. We try to find that in a relationship and guess what happens? They walk away. We try to find happiness in something else. And it doesn't matter whatever it is that you're trying to find the happiness is. The happiness that you're trying to find in that will always leave you broken. Because the thing that you're trying to fix, you can't fix. Because ladies and gentlemen, your brokenness is because of sin. Next slide, Mark, if you would. So what happens? So God has given us the gospel of Jesus through Jesus, Jesus Christ. He wants us to share that message and that with everyone because it doesn't matter who you run into. It doesn't matter who you come in contact with. Ladies and gentlemen, everybody, no matter, they're going to have some brokenness in your life. I was sharing that I cannot tell you how many people that I come in contact with anymore. Remember how, and, and I was sharing in Sunday school, and this is going to happen to you. Remember how you walk up to somebody and you just ask them the question, hey, how's your day? Or you say to them, have a good day, or, or what's going on? And you just expect maybe to make eye contact or not make eye contact and walk on. You're just trying to be nice. But all of a sudden, they say to you, my life sucks. What do you do? Say, have a good day, I'll see you later. Let me tell y'all something. There are a bunch of people out here in this life that don't know you, never met you, but they will tell you their life story in three minutes. Because they're looking for someone to try to help fix the problem. And we got the solution and we won't tell them. Well, I can call my pastor. I can set you up with him. Or um, uh, I, I think there's a good therapist down here, you know, that, that I've heard about. Uh, th they'll do that. Uh, next slide, Mark. You see, what God wants to do in the brokenness is he wants us to repent and believe the gospel. Because what's God trying to do? Ladies and gentlemen, God is trying to get us back to his design. He is pursuing us to have a relationship with him. But we're broken. And he's saying what you've got to do is you've got to repent and believe. There's a lot of people that repent and never get out of the brokenness. You want to know why? Because they don't believe. There's a lot of people that are sorry for what they've done. And that's as far as it goes. God's saying, no, do you believe? Do you believe in my son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross to save you, to give you life so that he can restore that? Next slide, Mark, if you would. So what's God doing? Just what I told you, ladies and gentlemen. God is trying to pursue us. For why? To recover the initial thing that Jesus 
or that God intended. How long did that take? Two minutes? Took two minutes to share the gospel presentation with somebody, no matter what their problem or issue was. And guess what? It doesn't take a PhD. It didn't tell all, all it, I didn't have all of the, you know, uh, Bible verses. If you've got some, you want them, you can use them. But if you don't have those, well, guess what? You don't need it. To tell somebody about Jesus, to tell somebody about God who is pursuing us and wants us to recover that relationship. Two minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to start having gospel conversations with everybody you meet. Because they're dying and they're going to hell. And it doesn't take a, it, it doesn't take a PhD in Bible history to be able to tell somebody about Jesus. Not at all. In a few weeks, I will sit with you, whoever wants to, and I will work with you on how to do this, to share with people. In just a short period of time, because why? Here's my question. Number one, when was the last time you had a gospel conversation with anybody? I'm not talking about a conversation, how are you, how you doing, what's going on in your life. I'm talking about when was the last time you talked to someone about a relationship with the one true God who is pursuing them and wants to love them and can't help but love them can't help but be their God and can't help but pursue them. When's the last time? Now, let me ask you another question. When was the last time you ever led anyone to the Lord? Let's get serious. For some of you, it's been never. For some of you, it's been years. For some of you, it's been months. For others, thank God, it's only been a couple of weeks or a few days. Friday night, the youth were in here. And guess what? Two people sat down with one of those youth that was having questions and led that young lady to the Lord. Every Sunday almost, almost every Sunday, somebody's back there talking with kids in Awana on Sunday night, leading a kid to the Lord. Sunday morning, while you guys are in here, enjoying getting your toes stomped on, Somebody's back there teaching those little kids about Jesus, and guess what? That's the only Jesus some of them will ever hear. And guess what? That little eight-year-old little boy that you don't like jumping around and running around and everything else may be the next person that is Billy Graham. Let me say this to you. I was that eight-year-old little boy that drove everybody nuts, that nobody wanted to teach me, nobody wanted me in their class. It wasn't that I was a bad kid. It was just they didn't want to listen to my questions because they didn't have the answers. They thought they had to have the answers. You don't need to have all of the answers. And that eight-year-old little boy or little girl that gets saved, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to ask them, well, do you know what it means to be a Christian? Absolutely not. You want to know why? Because you don't know. So how in the world do you expect them to know? You say, I know what it means to be a Christian. Okay, let's sit down and let's talk. 
Let's talk real quick. We'll find out how much we really don't know. I have no clue what God's going to do tomorrow or the next day or anything else. But you know what? I don't care that he's got it and plan, man, and I'm okay with it. Because if I get, if I get hold of the plan, I'm going to mess it up. So guess what? I'm just hanging with, I'm hanging with him and going with the flow. And wherever you want to go, Lord, let's go. <laughs> you, got, you, got my, you got my attention. But the question is this. You next door neighbor, where are they going? The person that cuts your hair, where are they going? The person that checks you out at the grocery or at Walmart, where are they going? You're saying, man, I can't talk to them. Yes, you can. Absolutely. Let me tell you all something. You can have a gospel conversation with everybody in there, and they won't stop. It takes two minutes. I always go into the store. I never buy one article. Diana will send me to the store to buy one or two things. I end up always buying at least six to seven. You want to know why? So I can talk to whoever it is that's ringing me out. I don't like going to these self-serve things where you got to scan them yourself because I can't have a conversation with that stinking machine. I want to have a conversation with somebody in the flesh. Do I do everything right? No. Absolutely not. Do I miss opportunities to tell people about Jesus? Yes. And you know what I did? I let Satan steal my inheritance because God had a plan to give me something and I lost it. Because I was too busy thinking about something else. My question to you, ladies and gentlemen, is this. How much are you going to let him steal of your inheritance? How ticked off do you get because somebody takes something from you? Honestly, think about it. When's the last time you threw a hissy fit because somebody took something from you? Or... The last time you threw a hissy fit because somebody bumped your car. Well, I can't believe you did that. You just messed up my car. But you got 28 dents on it. Yeah, but you put the 29th. You messed up my car. But yet, how many times do we get upset because and ticked off with Satan because we let him steal our inheritance? Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to get mad. It's time for war. The Bible says we do not fight against flesh and blood. We fight against principalities and powers of darkness. It is the enemy. And the enemy is not your neighbor. The enemy is Satan. You can let him steal it. That's up to you. But this morning, I'm asking you, are you ready to fight? To fight for what's yours, what is honestly belongs to you? Or are you going to let all of life steal it from you? Let me say this to you. And be as honest as I can. When you get up tomorrow, it is not going to be fair. When you get up tomorrow, you're probably going to have issues and you're probably going to have problems. And you're probably going to want to go right back to bed. And you're probably going to look and you're going to say, God, why? Why me? You know what his answer is? Why not? Why not you? Don't you know I love you? Don't you know? That that old saying, God will not put anything on you that you cannot bear, it is not in the Bible. Because if you could handle all of the problems, you wouldn't need God. But what God does say is that everything worketh to the good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. So you got bad things in your life you think are happening to you, let God turn them into good things. Let me say to you, there are times I've lost a job 
And I thought it was the last thing in the world, man. My world was caving in. And God gave me another job. And guess what? I was so tickled to death. I look back and I think, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. There were times when I thought I needed stuff. And I found out I wanted stuff. And I found out if I had gotten it, oh God, I would have been a mess. But may I say to you right now, God knows what you need. He wants to give it to you. He will supply your needs every day. But the question is, do you trust him? Will you, will you stop running And just say, God, I, I just want to restore the relationship between you and, you and I the way you want it to be. So God, can we start this thing over again? Can God, from this moment forward, God, can't we just, just can't love each other? God, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry of the mess that I've made of this relationship. It's your choice. Let's stand. Hello, this is Pastor Chuck Cotton from Calvary Baptist Church. First of all, I'd like to say thank you very much for taking the time out to either listen to our sermon or to watch it on video. We are grateful that you've actually taken the time and hope and pray that it has been a blessing to you as it was to us as we delivered it to our congregation. We ask if you have any questions whatsoever that you email us at Pastor Chuck at CalvaryBaptistMiddletown.org or you could come in and give us a phone call, if you would please, at area code 513-423-7251. I'd like to take this opportunity to also invite you to come to our church and visit us, if you would please. We actually have small groups on Sunday morning starting at 930 with our morning worship following at 1045. Prior to our morning um, small groups, we also provide donuts with coffee, um, milk, orange juice, a time for fellowship, get to know each other, have a good time before we actually break out into our small groups for Sunday. Our worship services are uplifting, they're fast moving, and everything in our service is just a fast pace. But we do take time every once in a while to slow down as we feel the Holy Spirit moving and we never want to hinder it in any way. We also have on Sunday evening, and during the school year, we have Awana, and Awana starts with the Puggles, actually from age two all the way up through high school. And during that period of time, we also have a worship service. Both of these start at six o'clock and end at 7.30. Our Wednesday night, we have a Bible study, which starts at seven, we generally finish about 8.15. We would love for you to come and visit with us, don't have to dress up, just come as you are, because to us, it doesn't matter. You're, you're a child of God, a creation of His, and so to us, you're important to everything that we do. Our motto here is building the kingdom one life at a time, and we hope that we have a chance to visit with you, get to know you as you get to know us. So thank you, and may God bless you.